Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the Round Table of Dim Lighting, we are continuing Sex Timber! That's when it falls. What does a tree symbolize? Um, a large penis? It's a phallus, yes. Okay. It's a phallus of Just some sort. Making sure we're on the same page. Um, last week was great. This week is gonna be great. We got another guest. To, to, just to enlighten just to, us. To keep us in, on proper information. Dr. Emily Nagoski, so excited about this, is a sex educator, speaker, and award-winning author of the New York Times best-selling book, Come As You Are, and the Come As You Are workbook, and co-author with her sister, Amelia, of the New York Times bestseller, Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. Dr. N, is what I'm gonna call her that right here. That stands for Nagoski is Director of Wellness Education at Smith College where she teaches a course on women's sexuality. She combines sex education and stress education to teach women to live with confidence and joy inside their bodies. Uh, we, you know, we've actually already had this conversation that you're about to listen to. I gotta say, I learned a lot. Yeah. Uh, she instructed us to call her Emily, that's why we call her Emily, although she is a doctor, and as you will see, a very well qualified one at that. Uh, continuing to enlighten these uh, these boys that are just hungry to learn about sex. If you don't wanna hear <laughs> um, specific and explicit talk about sex, um, don't listen to this episode, that's your warning. Midterm elections are coming up on November 8th and across the US people are gonna be voting on some pretty crucial spots in Congress, governors, and special elections and we want you to vote too. Yeah, so Vote Like a Beast is here to help you. Go to votelikeabeast.com, you can check your voting status there, you can register if you need to, and you can stay informed on midterm elections. We're also selling some stickers over at votelikeabeast.com and 100% of our profits go directly to our partners over at vote.org. This is a website that we created to help you. So be your mythical best by supporting a great nonprofit that helps all Americans exercise their right to vote. Go to votelikeabeast.com. I noticed that you are, I, I listened to the uh, will lack of sleep kill you, by the way, yes it will, um, and you had a conversation about Link's glasses, at, and I am wearing very similar glasses, and I thought, oh good, I I'm not going to have to explain about your glasses, and now you're not wearing those glasses. Uh, do you have them? Oh, now you want me to wear the glasses? Well, I mean. Of course I have the glasses. I feel like, hold on. Uh, <laughs> I feel like making guests feel at home. You know, we don't always have guests. It's just when we want to talk about something uh, where we want an expert involved, even a sexpert involved, uh, I want them to feel welcome. Mm -hmm. So I wear mine because uh, I'm, I get migraines and the light from my screen is a trigger and this filters out the blue light that activates it. So are yours also for medical reasons or you just want to look like Yeah, well, let's, let's, I can't John. wait for this answer. Um, you wearing those for medical reasons? <laughs> uh, yeah, because I mean, being being feeling good is medical, right? These make Absolutely. me feel good. They make me feel good. I'm glad that we are we're cohorts now. Yeah, Emily, we can share this. <laughs> look at that. We're seeing the world in an orange I gotta tent. Say, now... Boy, and you look cool. I don't care about I don't care about okay. medical reasons. You can just do it for the cool. Can I just say that now that this has happened, I feel very left out. Like Aww. you're damn you know, right, uh, and you are left out. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. <laughs> Look I feel what like he's going to come back in year two thousand New Year's Eve glasses. <laughs> I'm just mad that like he was giving me nothing but about my glasses, which I don't care about that. That didn't make me mad, that's his problem. But now, because he respects you so much, Emily, I guess, or wants to impress you, he's totally switched sides. Like, I know he's gonna come back with something. Uh, yep. If nothing else happens, I have made your life easier. Yes. Oh my gosh! Those are prop glasses. Like, you're I, not gonna wear those out in the real I've world. Been, I've been meaning to, I didn't know it was gonna happen this soon, but um, 
battle feel, of the glasses. I kind of feel like I've been forced into this. Okay, so you're making fun of me and Emily no, because I'm we're doing this I sincerely. Just, <laughs> this you know, is she has migraines. Sincere? She has migraines, and I have. I'm cool. You never know when migraines you're not. might start. You're neither. You never know when migraines might start. I, I mean, you're nothing to things us. Things start happening when. You know what? I think we are not the same. Uh, we're all basically the same age. We're, Let's you're, talk about sex. Yeah, I, I am. Was, I was born in seventy-seven. You're a seventy-seven. Seventy-seven. Baby. Seventy-eight. Baby. This is supposed to be about sex. Things start happening. You get migraines. I'm gonna find a way to make this relevant to sexuality. I'm, I'm getting so sexually frustrated right now. Like I feel the blue balls are real. I feel. Very sexy, and you know what? That it, let's talk about that a little bit because about blue balls. Uh, well, we can talk about blue balls. Oh, if, we can talk about blue are balls. blue balls real? Because hold on, I was about to ask a question before we no. get to blue balls. I don't care about you and your glasses. Uh, and that is how you feel about the way that you look can have an impact on your uh, what happens in the the bedroom, so to speak, right? Oh yeah, body image and stress are the top two things that hit the brakes which I'm sure we'll talk about the dual control model, but body image and stress, top two. Trauma, not far behind. Okay, so yeah, but to get the blue balls out of the way, because right. everything you just <laughs> mentioned is where we're going in this in this podcast, are blue balls really a thing because I, or is it just something that sexually frustrated people with balls dangle over others to, to, to get what they want? I actually don't know. I think I've experienced Tell me what it. you mean by blue balls, because people mean different things. Uh -huh. Like, I am- you talking about my, av Avatar? My body is ready. <laughs> like, I, like if, if things continued another, let's say, you know, five or 10 minutes, then I could ejaculate. Or one, right. let's say, let's not make this about me. One could ejaculate. <laughs> yeah. One with balls could ejaculate, and then, so like physically there's a pain of the, all the soldiers lining up to go into battle, Yeah. but but yet at the but last it's, second it's, just it's like, a drill. oh, you know what? Uh, we're calling off, back to the barracks. It's just a war game. Back to the balls barracks. You know. You're not, you're not, you're not coming out to the war games. And so, it hurts. No, it is war games. And there is a, there, the, the balls don't actually turn blue, but no. they hurt. They, it, there is it a hurts. physical discomfort that can come with experiencing a really high level of arousal and then having that stop, especially if it stops suddenly. Yeah. And there is nothing dangerous about it. Nobody has ever died or even suffered an injury. Death by blue balls. As a result balls. of, yeah. Okay. Um, and the problem arises when someone takes the discomfort of a sudden interruption of a high level of arousal as entitlement to orgasm. Like you have to, because right. I don't feel I, uh -huh. I need it. You don't need it. Nothing bad is gonna happen to you. Okay. If you if you really need to keep going, go be by yourself for a couple of minutes and get the job done if you want to. Yeah. Um and okay. uh, mostly what you're experiencing is sexual frustration, which no one has ever Suffered injury due to sexual frustration. Right. Okay. Good to hear. So don't don't dangle the blue balls as 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 an some sort of ultimatum. And don't worry that next time you get blue balls that you might die. Yeah. Literally, nothing bad will happen to you, except that your partner, who is like, you know what, I'm not ready to go any further. You can be like, oh, okay, we can stop now, and they'll have mad respect for you. <laughs> um, well, let's talk. Can we talk about the book? I'm going to take a yeah. back out. Now, I'm, uh, come as you are. I, this is an amazing book. I know it's been out for like seven years. The fact that it, I mean, it's a testimony to how powerful this book is as a resource to people. I love it. This is our recommendation today. Come as you are. Um, Emily's book, one of many. What's the name of your new book, by the way? The stress one. Burnout. Oh, burnout. Burnout. Yeah. We're going to we'll shout out that one too. But, Shout um, out to burnout. So my my daughter Lily, um, you know, when she went off to college last year, a mentor of hers gave her this book, and I saw it around because I noticed the cover. Like the cut, this is one. This is a brilliant cover. I mean, I know. it's it's uh, eye catching pink, and then there's a open zipper that is very vulvic. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, if hmm. I don't know if that's what you were going for, but I'm pretty sure it was. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I think it's just a purse. That's <laughs> right. That thing's got to be on the shelf in Barnes and Noble. You can't be just having a vulva out there. This is an amazing. This is one of the best book covers I have ever seen. But I gotta <laughs> be honest. Like there's a dark side to it. Like, yeah. I I get a little. It's a little visceral when you think about like putting your wiener in a in uh-huh. in some um something that could zip something that can zip up like you, you get a little Ooh. something about and trust Mary me, during kind my of a te- thing. during my teenage years the, there was very few things that I wouldn't place my wiener in you know uh the, the, the ways there's that whole you could, reddit communities the about ways that. that you the ways that you could find a masturbate as a teenager was just I feel like I could write a book about that I mean zippity doo zippity you know, it probably wouldn't sell as well as yours. Have you, you know, I have a friend who had been purse. masturbating since before he, since he was like a little kid. Um, and the way he masturbated was to lie in his stomach and hump his mattress and have an orgasm and just feel like done. Uh, I lost my virginity and... to a mattress, I'll t- to my bed, actually. I'll tell you about that in a second. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you just told her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, when he was about 13, he did his usual humping the mattress feels really good. And all this stuff. Came out of his penis, and he yep. panicked. He was sure he had broken something, so yep. he ran to his mom mm-hmm. and was oh. like, "This, oh, I don't know what happened, but I'm really worried that some, like there's a disease." Or and his mother was totally cool about it. She was like, "This is just a normal part of what happens. Let's go run the laundry, and you're going to be just fine. This is probably going to keep happening." That's right. one of my favorite stories of like an early masturbation experience that didn't reinforce shame, but mm. was just like, "Yeah, that's normal. That happens." Because well, it could have gone another way. Well, it it, it did with us. <laughs> you know, we we come. I from... never ran to my mom and told her anything about my jizz. Right. Well, we come from a conservative evangelical Christian background uh, that. You know, it gives you a certain um, set of beliefs about sex that then you have to deconstruct as you as you go, grow older. Uh, but yeah, the first time I masturbated, I definitely thought I broke my. Dick. I was not about to tell my mom about it. But then you were you were pleasantly surprised that it wasn't powder. You the told discovery us last year. the discovery of the having sex with the bed, <clears throat> which if you're listening and you want and you need any tips, I will say that you just find something uh, like a shoe. Uh, and usually two shoes. Because the thing about shoes, now just ro- roll with me here, is that the you know a shoe has like a gradation. Like if you get like a Converse All Star, if you take the mattress and the box spring, right? So you've got the mattress and the box spring. You can put the shoes in, and the further you wedge the shoes in, it changes the size of the opening between your mattress and your your uh, box springs. And that's the thing that you're screwing, by the way, is that opening. And you just dial it in. So you're penetrating the gap between the mattress and the bedspread. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a sideways vagina. And then I hope you're using a lot of lube. Well, it, 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 here's the thing. Yeah, I don't. It. I definitely don't recommend this because uh, there was it. I mean, I, you know, I was like a 15 year old kid. That I mean, what happens when I you flip your mattress? My hands could have been made of <laughs> sandpaper, and it wouldn't have stopped. It wouldn't have stopped me. I mean, as a 13 year old boy, I was religiously flipping my mattress every month. Rotate. No, there's a flip. Ta- there's a towel. There's in a there. flip. There's, there's a, a towel rotate, in there. Then there's a flip and rotate. There's a towel in there because you don't want you don't want your mom okay. to find that situation. You know, I mean, don't use your again. The friction shoes. just feels like it's going to be really high. Oh, I'm sure it was. It was probably not healthy, uh, but nothing could stop me. Nothing could stop me. You like pleasure spiked with pain, and music <laughs> is your aeroplane. Uh, w- one of my favorite things about your book, which we would actually like to do right now, if you don't mind, is we would like sure. to actually take. The sexual temperament quiz. Okay. On page uh, fifty-four. I mean, there's it's only ten questions, but before you we you can take it along with us. We, well, we can kind of we'll walk Listener. through our answers. That way, you can get to know us. Oh yeah, yeah. As you're listening, I, I thought we could read all the questions, give our answers, then Emily, you kind of know where we stand. Then we can kind of talk that out, and then talk about people who are maybe if we're the same, different than us, or different than the two of us, even if we're different. But give us some context. Um, for the sexual temperament questionnaire. 
Right. So this is a little Cosmo quiz version of the actual scientific instrument that researchers use to assess uh, what's known as the dual control model of sexual response. Okay. So the idea here is that humans, like all mammals, have a mechanism in their brain that controls sexual response. And it's a dual control mechanism, which means it has two parts. And the first part is a sexual accelerator that a lot of us are familiar with. It notices all the sex-related information in the environment. That's everything that you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, or crucially, everything you think, believe, or imagine that your brain codes as related to sex. It takes all the information in and it sends the turn-on signal that many of us are familiar with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's working at a low level right now. Here we are talking about sex. This is just a tiny little bit of sex-related information. So That's you're getting right. just a little tiny bit of activation of the accelerator at a subconscious level. Fortunately, at the same time, you have the second mechanism, the brakes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Noticing all the good reasons not to be turned on right now. <laughs> That's everything that you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, think, believe, or imagine that your mm. brain codes as a potential threat. And it sends the turn off signal. Both of them are functioning oh, okay. all the time. So your level of arousal at any given moment is a balance of how much the ons are turned on and how much the offs are turned off. Ooh, okay. And people have different sensitivities of these mechanisms. Most of us are piled up in the middle. We're just medium in the sensitivity okay. of our accelerator and our brakes. Some people have a really sensitive accelerator, which if you drive a car that's got a really sensitive accelerator, that's You're a gonna very You're going to do a lot of experience. jerking. This, you know, you're like gonna your head's going to jerk high, back. High, exactly. That's high sensitivity. Uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> and if you have a really low sensitivity accelerator, like it takes a lot more gas and a lot more time to get you where you want to go. And some people have a really sensitive break. These are actually the folks who are the most prone to sexual dysfunction because it turns out the best predictor of sexual difficulties is not not enough stimulation to the accelerator. It's too much stimulation to the brakes. So, as, so we, as we go, so I see that this there's- is a, This is a very helpful way to think about it. Yeah. Because it, it cause, you know, I think you talk about this uh, as well, just the, the, the misnomer of sex drive. Hey, well, let's get back to that. A, I don't want to talk about it yet. I want to do know, the test it's first. Great. I, the, I the, ever the, want to talk about that. But so, and then some people have a really low sensitivity of brakes, uh, which even if you're driving a car that just has like a regular level of accelerator sensitivity, if your brakes are not responsive enough, some not so great things can happen. Hmm, right. Okay. So for us, but I, most of us are in the middle. I see well, that. Let's find out. There's an inhibitors page, five questions, and so we're supposed to. A add up our numbers here, and then on the other page, there's an exciters five questions. So let's just go right. through them, and then we can kind of flesh this out. Okay. Okay. Um, on a scale of zero to four, zero meaning not like you at all, and four exactly like you, uh, answer this. Sometimes I have so many worries that I am unable to get aroused. Sometimes I have so many worries I'm unable to get aroused. Zero, not at all. Ooh, four, is, exactly like me. This is this is complex because. Okay, so uh, as a as someone who thinks about these things in the context of a twenty one year marriage, I think about the fact that stress often um, makes me want to go and. <laughs> Okay. But not necessarily have an encounter with my wife because that can sometimes yep. be like, well, yeah, I got, I got, in that scenario, I've really got to think about her and I've got to make it an enjoyable experience for her. And that can seem like work sometimes when you're already mm -hmm. stressed out. Right. So but you've already just told me something about the sensitivity of your accelerator. About 10 to 20% of people find that when their stress is increased, their interest in sex is increased. And it will not necessarily be for partnered sex or for their, relationship with their long-term partner, but it will increase their interest in sexual release, in porn, or in uh, a higher risk kind of sexual behavior. Um, so okay. my guess already is that you're going to score on the higher end of the sexual excitation scale, which is the accelerator. Yeah. So I think- Because I, I relate to that, but then I, you know, also when when I get 
where am I? I'm in a stressful zone. Like, oh, this this week or these couple of weeks have really piled up. I realize that I haven't thought about having sex. So definitely in high stress times, I'm like, oh yeah, it's it's now I'll call this a sex dry spell. Mm, all but, the old dry spell. But neither one of those is this. This is like this is about arousal. I have right? I, I have so many worries that I'm unable to get aroused. I think that I can always I mean, when I'm in go mode, it's like I can usually compartmentalize and overcome it. It's just a question of do I want to come it at all? But once I've oh. once I've engaged in being there, um, I don't get two in my head. So I'm, I'm going gonna, with I'm a gonna, one. I'm gonna put a one two. Next one. Unless things are quote just right, it is difficult for me to become sexually aroused. Zero. Um yeah, I, I'm a very meticulous person, and well, I the house could be burning down. I, well, yeah, I'm not gonna. I, I mean, you think someone could be like pummeling your? Someone could box, be actively a boxer intruding. could be pummeling your face. There could be an intruder taking my television, and be like, well, hold on now, <laughs> priorities, man. Yeah, uh, I'm, a, I'm gonna put so another one there. So people who score four on this are the people who like a stray piece of grit on the sheets, a stray fingernail, a stray thought, a stray sound in the hallway can just shut everything right down. Those are the people who are fours. For me, I'm like, if the dogs are still in the bed, that's their problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? That is their problem. I am not gonna live in a world where my dogs dictate if I'm able to get nooky or not. You haven't and Christy and I have had have, You haven't have trained your that. dogs? Barbara knows. They know something's up. Barbara knows that mommy and daddy are doing special time, and that's when she just goes into her her house. She like just she like kind of like okay, boom, 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 and then goes in there and then just kind of lays down and waits. Jade kind of looks away, <laughs> and I'll I'll pick them up and put them on. We have the a eye couch contact in our bedroom. is a problem. I'll put yeah. the I'll put the <laughs> dogs on the couch, and then so they can watch. And then uh, if they want to, I do You're not an care. Exhibitionist. That's my thing. Is that like, and. Um, yeah, Christy's fine with that too. But if like the dog's trying to like crawl up in there and like get in your get in somebody's face, yeah, you're like, have mm -hmm. that. what's going on? It's like Jasper. We have a dog like that. <laughs> she wants to participate. Right. So you got to set her outside. You just got to close the door. Yeah. 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 Part I, participate. Yeah. That's a uh, that's a lot. All right. So I mean, she just wants to be like right up in there. Like, <laughs> she, hi she, everybody. Yeah. She sees love happening. Yeah. It's like she this is not. Yes. On it. This looks like a fun game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dogs do. They do tend to know that something's up. They're like, they do face away. Mm. <laughs> I think that I don't know. They can see and smell a lot of things we can't. Right. I think a lot. Yep. The smell has a lot to do with it. If I am uncertain how my partner feels about me, it's harder for me to get aroused. Okay, I can. I'm. I'm gonna move up this one. Like, if I know, if I'm uncertain. It's like is something is Christy mad at me or what have I have I done something? Yeah, I mean that's gonna you know mm -hmm. you you want you this is a I want I want I want this to be like us both to be at the party, you know what I'm saying? Well, I have this thing that happens. And I get concerned about that. Emily, so I, help me I'm understand gonna put a, this. I'm gonna put a three for that. I'm gonna put a one for this because sometimes uh Jesse first of all, we have a what I call a High frequency, low uh, amplitude conflict situation in our marriage, right? So there's you fight a lot, but it's never really we don't we don't blow out build, we don't build up the resentment and then it blows out. It's just like we're we're constantly kind of like in love and also arguing with each other. It's a beautiful thing. It's lasted for 21 years. Yeah, and we're not like that. Um, and sometimes when she gets mad at me. It turns me on. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but like she'll like she's like she she's got an opinion about something and she's really getting into it. And then like I'm all like we're having an argument about something, and then I'm just like, oh, and like just something, just something happens, and I'm kind of turned on. I don't know what it is. And not like in a like we don't do like the dom stuff where like we don't we haven't experimented with that. I'm not saying I wouldn't. We just haven't done that yet. So it's not like oh, you know, dominate me, but it's more. You're a little, getting a little feisty. That's a little sexy right now. And then she starts laughing, and then it usually diffuses the situation. That's not why I'm doing it. It's just my natural response. 
Am I am I okay, Emily? <laughs> you are, you are. You're normal. You're fine. There could be a couple of different explanations for why it happens, and I think a big part of it is the fact that your anger is not ex escalating to a high level. You're just a little irritated or annoyed. And then she is irritated and annoyed in response. And first of all, that's a connection. That's an emotional connection. You haven't escalated to a place where you're no longer connected. John Gottman's research shows that when people's heart rates get above 100 beats per minute, they lose their ability to listen to each other. Mm. But you're not allowing the stress levels in your body to escalate to that point. You're just getting a higher level of activation than usual together and Am I wrong in thinking that you enjoy your wife as a person? You're not wrong. Huh. So, like, here she is being her full personhood. You are connected together at a high level of intensity that is not disconnecting you. Yeah. It makes sense to me that that would be arousing. And that's There's one of the also... reasons I fell in love with her, too. Like, you know, when we were dating was that she just got, she was passionate about stuff. And it was like, damn, I like that. So I think I'm just continuing to be attracted to her in that way. Yeah, yeah. For, for me, it's more about it. connection than it is about the conflict. To me, is like let's the resolution is what brings on the horny mm -hmm. for us. It's like mm -hmm. but making up. Is, yes, is that very fun? Yeah. So that's very much about attachment. So the biology of love is human attachment. It originates in the fact that our infants are entirely dependent on their adult caregivers. If you leave them by the side of the road, they will just die of exposure if they're not eaten by a bear first. Mm -hmm. Human yeah. babies are ridiculous. They're heavy, they make a lot of noises, they smell weird, right? Yeah. And if they're, they weren't so adorable. They're uglier than we care to admit. But, and I yet, know adorable, yes. When somebody hands you a baby and is like, this one's yours, keep it alive. No matter how like frustrated and resentful you feel, there is nothing on earth that will stop you from showing up to help that baby mm -hmm. when that baby needs you. That's attachment. Uh, and around adolescence, that infant caregiver system gets co-opted into peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Um, now, when you're an infant, your life literally depends on your adult caregiver coming back when you need them. When you're an adult, that's not literally the case, but your body doesn't know that. So when there is a threat to your attachment object, a threat to this attachment connection, one of the strategies adults have to reconnect when there's a threat to the attachment is sex. So that's why makeup sex and even breakup sex can be so intense, mm. is it's fueled by this like desperate, oh my God, I need to fix this attachment or else I could die. Wow. Mm. Well, that's Damn. why, so, so I gave that a three. I, I gave it a one. You gave it a one, okay. If I am worried about taking too long to become aroused or to orgasm, this can interfere with my arousal. Um, uh, if I'm worried about taking too long to become aroused or orgasm. I feel like I'm watching two guys grapple with the question that women would be like, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the interesting thing, you know, in, in when you have a penis, uh, obviously, obviously there, there are, there, there's lots of signals that are happening, uh, you know, uh, with a, uh, vulva and vagina and everything down there. Uh, but there can be this, like, am I at full, um, full mast, half mast? Because there's such an obvious, like you're either on or you're off. Uh, I do think that there could be times like, oh, it's not happening as fast as I expected this to happen. Or, oh, oh, am I about to, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to go longer tonight. I'm really trying to go for it tonight to show how great of a lover I am. And, oh gosh, I'm about to lose my erection. You know, like, yeah, that, that, those kind of th things can get into your head at mm -hmm. times. So I would, I think I might go with a, a good two on this one. Uh, I'm gonna give it a one. Um, sometimes I feel so shy or self-conscious during sex that I cannot become fully aroused. I'm gonna put a zero for that. Yeah, that doesn't for happen me. for me. Okay, so that that's all we have Again, on Again, the women side. are all like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so that yeah, was I'm a just total not... of four there. Oh, you got And both of those are for cultural reasons. There's nothing innate in being born in an it's a girl kind of body that makes a person 
self-conscious about their body or feel shy about sexuality. That's entirely cultural. It's because we're trained from birth to hate our bodies and feel ashamed of our genitals. Mm -hmm. Boo. Mm -hmm. I know, right? Boo. (laughs) Let's move over to exciters. I I got a total of six there. You got a total of four for inhibitors. Uh, 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 Did I win? Same scale, dang. zero to four. I'm very, like, I'm very competitive. I was gonna say, I was like, dang, because <laughs> I, I took the test too, just to see like the, the female yes. perspective, and I was like, dang, that's what they got. I have uh, a twelve for 12. mine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll come well, back so, to that. So you know what? You win unless this is golf and I win. I win. <laughs> and Jenna wins. If it's traditional sports, Jenna wins. All right. <laughs> Keep Somebody, taking it. Somebody's got to win. <laughs> On the In my zero side. sum world. Seeing a partner doing something that shows their talent or intelligence or watching them interacting well with others can make me very sexually aroused. Zero, not like me. Four, exactly like me. Oh, this is a big one for me, man. I think somebody can become, um, uh, somebody can become much more attractive when they are demonstrating their intelligence. You talking talking about hot for teacher? Uh, Yeah. The top for teacher. Uh Uh-huh. And also, dynamic. someone, uh, you know. Well, maybe that's a different dynamic. Well, likewise, someone can become very unattractive um, when there's nothing there except the, the external. Yeah, like, I, Mr. I, Bryant I'm, was a great physics teacher, but there were other things that, and I liked his sense of humor, but there were just things about him that uh, yep. didn't make me horny. Well, it, you know, I think it's the kind of thing that, Sorry like, to bring you into this, Mr. Sc- Bryant. You're scrolling through <laughs> Instagram and you see, uh, you know, there, it's not uncommon. <laughs> it's not uncommon to see a beautiful woman uh, on Instagram. Oh, well, on your For You page. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, yeah, and I think the algorithm knows that I like beautiful women. Uh, but then when you go to the profile and see that, it seems that the the... Uh, the it, extent, algorithm knows what you think a beautiful the, it, woman is. The extent of this account yes. is beautiful woman. At that point, it's like I'm not as attracted to this person at this point. Yeah. But if this person was like, couldn't you have a video of you solving some physics equations? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mr. Bryant was a physics teacher. I don't know if I said that, but yes. Okay. <laughs> Dissecting um, a frog. Mr. Bryant. So was seeing, hot. T- seeing. Uh, Exuding talent or intelligence or interacting well with others, like uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a three. What'd you put? I put a four. Okay. When I think about someone, I find sexual. What'd you put, Jenna? We'll go, we'll go one by one this time. Oh, uh, I, I put a three. Yeah. Three. Okay. A- intelligence and and passionate is yeah, I like. Mm-hmm. When I think about someone I find sexually attractive or fantasize about sex, I easily become sexually aroused. Oh yeah, four. Yeah. I mean, if I'm gonna f- what? What if, else? If what, I'm gonna, f- why would I be fantasizing? What do I expect is gonna happen? I mean, what? What else could happen if you help fantasize? us understand someone, Emily, who might score that low? Did you score it low, Jenna? Uh, uh, I I did not score it low. I I've actually uh, I'm a high accelerator. I'm more the uh, don't skip smaller. ahead. I'm just saying, yeah, but. What number? I got, I put a three. All right, okay. three. Oh, you got you got a Tesla Model right. S up in there, <laughs> Emily. What what were you gonna say? So people with low sensitivity accelerators are less likely to fantasize in the first place, and when they do fantasize, it's more a traditional experience of daydreaming, where they're just imagining that something could happen without it necessarily being a really visceral experience. I don't see. I I don't know that I've ever sat around and just had a fantasy. What do you mean? Are you saying that like you've had like a fantasy for the sake of like the utility to be able to masturbate and you don't consider that a fantasy? Because obviously you've done that. Yeah. Like when you're walking down the street or you're sitting <laughs> in heavy traffic, you're daydreaming, letting your mind wander and it goes to like sexual things that could happen or yeah. couldn't happen. That's kind of, yeah. Okay, well that, I'll change mine too. That happens quite a bit. Yeah, but yeah, 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 that makes sense. If okay. it is possible someone might see or hear us having sex, it is more difficult for me to get aroused. Watch the numbers on this one. It's reverse so, scored. Reverse scored. Four means not like me at all. Zero is exactly like me. So the scale goes so, down the more you relate to this. If it, if it is possible someone might see or hear us having sex, it's more difficult to get aroused. I not, That's not like me at all. I mean... We were in the car going at it, and a hiker walks by. And then 
I was like, just just get down. How just close? Kinda hide. We were both down, but like. Uh, right on the outside of the window, but like you know, there's mm. the the sun had gone down, and I think you the, the hiker would probably see a reflection of themselves. Not were of, the windows uh, steamy? Potentially, yeah. It it was early on though, in the in the festivities. But then another okay. hiker walked by, and another hiker. It was a freaking cavalcade of hikers, like they were in like a chain. They try, well, you should never hike alone, really. Because but the when more you, when you get the more trouble. hikers that came by, the more I was kind of into it. Especially when it's dark out. What are these? I don't think they were hikers. I think they might have been. Um, it it might have been scavengers. A hookup spot. Oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a. Yeah. It's a. It was dusk, and they okay. were. They were wearing hiking attire. Hiking gear. Okay. They had spent a day on the mountain. Maybe that's their kink. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so for me, but I your put, experience. I put a four with. People That's not like by. me at all because I do not. It that, that does not make it more difficult for me to get aroused. Whereas another person in that situation, like the first hiker goes by and you're like, ah, ah, and the second person goes by and you're like, oh no, we're done. Yeah, yeah. I put a three on this one. Uh, I, I I downgraded from a four. Uh, we you know we talked on a previous podcast about how sometimes you'll be staying in one of those. Um, Hotels, and uh, I don't know what part of the conversation on the previous podcast was edited out, so I don't know what I can. I know I don't listen back to it, but uh, I, all I was saying was that you're in a high rise hotel and you realize that you've left the window open, and then like my disposition is just like, okay, that I, I there's a little bit of an exhibitionist in me, right? Um, and then recently, speaking of hiking, we're entertainers, Jesse and I went on a hike and it was a pretty, you know, we're, it's Los Angeles, so there, you, you, you can't get alone on, on a hiking trail. But there was like off no banks on this particular on uh, trail, and I was like, "Hey, like, uh, what do you think about taking a little offshoot, finding a big rock or something, and you know, having a little fun?" Mm -hmm. And she was like, "That okay, that sounds fun." Uh, but we did not realize that we had gotten ourselves in a situation. Now, first of all, also I'm six seven, she's five three. You do the math on that. And uh, what would that be? Subtraction? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's yeah. your? Okay, go. Ahead. We were both standing up. Oh, you know, oh, on like a creek bank, and that was when we realized that the tr main trail looped back around and was like twenty feet from us, and like <laughs> saw like three heads like walking by, <laughs> and at that point, <laughs> I would say that the reason I immediately was like, oh, and she was also like that. Was just I just don't want to be you know what if I get recognized man you know I don't it's just I don't want that to be the memory that someone has of me so that's why I'm not putting a four because well, yeah, you don't want to educate like a family of <laughs> yeah somebody calls from the trail hey rat <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah that's Awkward. the situation that I'm not interested in but if you're staying in a hotel that's got thin walls. And you know that the people can hear you. Like my disposition is to get louder and like put on a show for the people in the next room. Not in an impositional way, <laughs> but just like don't let that be the reason that you get quiet. You know what I'm saying? So I'm gonna go with the three. All right. Um, I do wanna point out that there are a lot of people for whom the idea of potentially being caught or seen is arousing. But the reality of being in a situation where they could be caught or seen is not, it just shuts everything down. Um, and that's totally normal. It's because the context of actually being in a situation where you could be seen and potentially not safe is different from the fantasy world where you can control the idea that you actually are totally safe the whole time. Yeah, that's but a good you get to have delineation. The idea. All right, so I'm gonna yeah, lower mine helpful. from a four to a three for that's that reason. Helpful. Jenna, what did you put? Well, we have we have slightly different editions of the book, so my my quiz is a yeah. little different than than yours. Uh, so I don't have that question, but oh. I what would you uh, say? as someone who has done those things and also been caught in those situations, uh, <laughs> I I'd say do tell I'd say probably like. Like a three, like if you don't, if I if I don't get caught, it's really okay. fun. It was really fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. really like it. But yeah, You're, getting getting caught, I'm like, crap. This is this is very embarrassing and mortifying. The quiz changed from edition to edition because people requested that I put in one that was more inclusive of people of every gender and hormone yeah. combination. Mm -hmm. uh, Therapist in particular it. wanted me to make it so that anybody in a couple could take the same quiz. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Is that the so one that's that we why have? They're different. We've got the new yeah. one. 
We've got I spent my pandemic one. rewriting Come As You Are. <laughs> yes. Um, here's a straightforward one. Two more to go. Particular scents are very arousing to me. Four, exactly like you. One, not at all. You go in a bed, bath, bath and body works, and you just like, you got to. That's gotta, not a place. You got to. What? <laughs> It's Bed Bath and Beyond or Bath and Body Works. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you said Bed Bath and Body Works, which, first of all, great collab idea, <laughs> because I think that would work. I think there's a, the, the the Venn diagram of is just a circle there. I'm saying this is not much like me. I, I don't I don't really think about. I mean, we've said on the show that stink makes maybe me think horny. more about body smell. I was about to say, yeah, dude, I put a four because oh, you know, I was talking about candles. No, man, the smell of this, I mean, let's just, you know, so let me, t- my, the, my biggest disappointment in Goop, um, uh, I have many, <laughs> is uh, is the fact that the the candle that's supposed to smell like a vagina doesn't smell like a vagina. Uh, it's just a gimmick. What does it smell like? It just smells like a good candle, right? Like, I don't feel like yeah. there was much it's effort too, put, we had one on the show, and, you know, I haven't, I'm not saying I've smelled a lot of vagina. It was candle fragrant. There was no, it, it, there wasn't any like human scent in, I, yeah. like, that I could detect. I'm sure no two vaginas smell the same, but there's a general, there's a there's a general sort of sort of undertone. Yeah, right. That I think is, I mean, that's the best smell in the world. And, and th- when we talk about stink, make me horny. That's what what some people, you know, there's there's this like subversion of this is an interesting scent. Unlike any other scent, but whether it's a vagina or any other scent, it's like, oh, this is provocative versus some well, other and response. And I would go, I would go a step further and say that I'm still going to put mine at you a You know, two. I regret the fact that in modern society we become so, you know, cleanliness obsessed because, like, the whole that whole idea of like somebody stinking a little bit and it making you horny is like that feels like that was the norm for most of human history until we started deciding that we had to like. Always smell of uh, completely clean, right? Aren't we just washing all our pheromones off? Isn't that what's happening these days? Humans don't have pheromones. Oh snap! That's why we bring people who know what they're talking about on this podcast. Well, actually, we don't very often. But see, well, let's, how, how, let me how... say that <laughs> there is no evidence yet that we have pheromones. So, ugh. so I, I can't uh, say yes. It's because of pheromones. What is people a pheromone? do smell different? They're like tiny chemicals that communicate information about sex. Okay. By which I mean, like, which what? one you are. Uh, and like for a whole lot of other animals, the vomeronasal gland is actively functioning in uh, perceiving pheromones, but there's no evidence that humans actually, we have a vomeronasal gland, but there's no evidence that we're excreting pheromones for it to detect. What we can smell when like, you know, you smell t-shirts and you can tell which one is your spouse. Correct. What we're smelling is a combination of things, but in particular MHC, which is a factor in your immune system that says something about how similar to you this person's immune system is. Interesting. Whoa, and the more similar, the more attracted? The opposite, because the more similar, the more likely you are related. Ha! Oh, wow, because yeah, we we, talk, we did the thing on the show a while back, and we did very, a very tame version of it, but it was based on that study, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which is where they gave people the shirts to smell, and right. then your what you found attractive through smell lined up what you found attractive physically, um, or what I'm sure I'm giving a bad interpretation of it. But basically, you could anticipate who you would be Everybody attracted to. Everybody gives a bad interpretation. <laughs> you could anticipate who you were going to be attracted to reliably by just smelling the the panties. shirt. Up. And maybe that the, it, it wasn't panties in this particular. I don't know of a study that does that does underwear. I think that would be a really interesting oh, experiment, shoot. but I don't hey. know of one. There we go. Yes, yeah, so let's see if we can get Bed Bath and be... Body Works to sign up for that experiment. <laughs> I mean, They're certain f- funded people... by Beth, Bed Bath and Body Works. People who put a four would be lined up around the block. So, what number did you put? I put a two. <laughs> uh, I put a four. Jenna. And let me say, this is one of the single best predictors of having a, quite a sensitive accelerator. Yeah, I'm I'm a four. I okay. smell is a big yeah. Mm-hmm. He who smelt it dealt it. I think about sex a lot when I am bored. This is the final one. Make it count. Mm-hmm. Zero, not at all. Four, exactly like me. When I'm bored, when I'm bored, I definitely think about sex more when I'm bored than when I'm not. I would say three, a lot like me. I'm gonna put a four just because I feel like this is my 
has been since I went through puberty. It's my default. Like if I get bored, it's the first thing that my my mind goes to. Jenna, what'd you put? Let's add these up. Uh, I'm a I'm a somewhat. I was I yeah. I think I that that one isn't in my quiz either. But okay. yeah, I think I'm. I I more if I'm bored, I usually make up whole entire romantic scenarios like the perfect date. Someone would take me on like the oh, whole wow. romance of it, and oh, I know okay. I never really get to the the just the sex part. I guess. All right, so <laughs> my to- let's go through totals. So on on this side of Exciter, I got a fourteen. Right. I got a nineteen. And Jenna, you're up there. Oh yeah, I'm I'm, I'm an eighteen. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. you're damn, you're an eighteen. Okay. So to have, w- 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 so I'm t- just to say this one more time, Emily, and then maybe you can like lump us into categories or or just tell us how to interpret this. Make just gross generalizations about all of us. I'm six. Fo- <laughs> I, I'm six fourteen. Rhett, I am four nineteen. And Jenna, you are twelve eighteen. Well, these are all. Bar- that's my wife's birthday. <laughs> so we're. So <laughs> what? Is. What are you going to do with that data? So you look up in the in the. Uh, oh graph like there's this there's an answer sheet that tells you like where your score lies in terms of low medium high for okay. each of the two scales yeah because so... one of the important things is the two do not co-vary like just because you're accelerator sensitive doesn't mean your brake is sensitive or insensitive right. okay so um in the inhibitor side with the brakes zero to six is low so rep, both of us are low Medium is seven to thirteen, and high is fourteen to twenty. So, uh, yeah, so I'm on medium. I'm on the medium. Yeah, medium. Mm-hmm. Okay, so should we just give us a little bit about what is it if you're on the low side? Mm-hmm. What does that mean if you're yeah. in low inhibition? When you have a low sensitivity break, what that indicates mostly it means that uh, your accelerator, regardless of how sensitive it is, is gonna have an easy time overpowering your brakes and so you'll be motivated to do things and all the good reasons not to be turned on right now your brain's not particularly convinced that those are good reasons so okay. if you see like a road closed sign you just drive through it to, you're to, like there's nobody coming it's fine to, you, to yeah. use a crude analogy and then yeah. and then on with, the... A, with the middle the combination of like a middle level accelerator plus a high or a middle level brake and a high sensitivity accelerator uh that's a good combination for when a person does not have adequate coping skills for dealing with uh what i'm gonna call maladaptive strategies for managing negative affect when they don't have good strategies for dealing with their stress overwhelm exhaustion depression loneliness they might, because their accelerator is so sensitive and their brakes are like, meh, uh, their accelerator will be like, well, let's just go do sex because sex feels really good and much better than this uncomfortable emotion I'm currently experiencing. And that's when a person is at risk for like having a higher risk relationship with sexuality. Okay, well, let's, and let's talk about, on the other side, Rep, both you and I are high. Jenna, what was your number again on the other oh, side? She was I'm high. I'm You're high, high too. Yeah. So both high. High You're exciter. all high. So, Dang. So what, maybe the best thing to talk about is what if there's a mismatch with our partners? Because I sure. like I know that Christy would be like, you know, has much more sensitive breaks than I've established that I do. So it's like, you know, I let, let's just talk about that. Like, right. I'll call it an extreme mismatch, but like what's the dynamic there? And then maybe we can interpolate some of those, like if you're in the middle of you're the same, but like, it seems like if yeah. you're both the same, then it's like, okay, this is easier. But if you're- Maybe, cause so even if you have like the same sensitivity of both of these parts of your brain, um, what they respond to might be really different. Okay, Like one of you, your brakes, responds very strongly negatively when there is a risk of being caught, for example. And the other one, not so much. And you sort of want to incorporate that kind of fantasy into your relationship. So it's less about the sensitivity of the mechanism than what the mechanism responds to. Gotcha. Mm. 
But let but let's talk about if if you're but when if people kind of have opposites. really sensitive brakes and not very sensitive accelerator, those are the folks who are most likely to turn up in sex therapy offices, uh, because like the slightest little tap on the brakes can shut everything down. And what's the first thing that happens in people's brains when a slight little change hits their brakes and they shut down? Then they start going. Oh, darn it, I hate when this happens every mm -hmm. single time. When am I ever going to get over this? And does that self-criticism, does it activate the accelerator or does it just hit the brakes more? Hit the brakes more. Yeah. So the, you can get into a spiral of like a sensitive brake being activated, self-criticism and even relationship criticism, criticism from your partner of like, man, why can't you just ignore it? Why can't you just get over it? Like, it's not that big a deal. Let's get back to it. Mm. Uh, and like everything just shuts down even more. So simply knowing this person has a sensitive break, a small distraction like a noise in the hallway, like kids rattling around in the hallway. Uh, there's uh, a sex researcher named Peggy Kleinplatz who interviewed an 80-something woman who said that the most important sex accessory was Vaseline. You put it on the doorknob. <laughs> <laughs> So if Whoa, that tiny little good. thing is going to distract you, just know that that's true. Know that that's just normal for this person. Oh, and I, oh. don't freak out about it. I was like, well, where is she inserting the doorknob? <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> yeah, your children's tiny hands. That yeah, that's uh, but that is an interesting interpretation of it. I would not suggest a doorknob, but you know, who am I? Right. Well, you're, uh, you're tall enough to just bend over, and the doorknob's right there. I could probably get one in my ass. Um, you know, it, make sure it has a flange. <laughs> <laughs> well, the yeah. whole door is the flange. Um, question, because I feel <laughs> like I have not been thinking that viscerally about it. Right. Thanks for that image. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, Emily. Yeah. Question for you, because I obviously I scored very high on this at, at, at 19. However, and, and I and I think that uh, my wife would be medium to. Medium to high, right? And I think that, but she would also interpret me sometimes as, to use the misnomer, which we can talk about, as having a lower sex drive, right? Because because we have a healthy amount of sex. She does initiate quite a bit. Um, and I Just think, for the record, a healthy amount of sex uh, is any amount of sex that feels right for you and your partner. That's why you're here. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, for us, we feel like it's a healthy amount of sex that we're both satisfied with. But I think the thing that happens often, because we've established that I'm thinking about sex quite a bit, right? And I'm pretty much ready to go at any time. But she may not at times interpret me in that way uh, because, you know, once once we are engaged with one another, it's, it, and I, I, I want it to be something that's not just a quick, obviously I can be satisfied and done in, in, you know, very, very quickly if I wanted to, if I didn't, if I wasn't taking her into account. But I, we don't ever, we, I mean, very rarely do we do that. Do we have like what I would just call a traditional quickie, right? We've had conversations about this where she's like, well, if that's, if you want to do that, then we can up our frequency of quickies. But I just never feel right about it. So we do, you know, uh, you know, we we go through the process, and we and then it becomes incredible. But sometimes there's a barrier to entry, literally, uh, of me wanting yeah. to engage in that way, which then is interpreted by her as a, you know, me not wanting to have sex. Yeah. So it's like, let's face it, it's kind of a project to get to the part where two people are both in the mood and ready. Can we talk about responsive and spontaneous desire? Yeah. Yes. Because I feel like, especially with a high excitation score and a medium to low breaks score, uh -huh. you're probably people who experience spontaneous desire for sex, where it just sort of out of the blue. Uh, Erica Moen is the cartoonist who illustrated Come As You Are, and she draws spontaneous desire as a lightning bolt to the genital, just kaboom, you do, oh, I would like to have some sexy, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you like, you take your lightning bolt to your partner and you're like, uh that's spontaneous desire. And your partner may or not may not be there at that time, but that is one of the normal healthy ways to experience desire. Another healthy normal way to experience desire, the research calls responsive desire, where instead of it being just a lightning bolt out of the blue, you like set up date night, you get childcare, you go to a bed and breakfast, you 
make plans. You show up in the moment. You put your body in the bed. You let your skin touch your partner's skin. And your body and your brain go, oh, right. I really like this person. I really like this. Hmm. And then you get the kaboom. And that's responsive desire, where spontaneous desire emerges in anticipation of pleasure. Responsive desire emerges in response to pleasure. Yes. And what you've done is you've created a context where your accelerator is activated and your brakes, all that stuff that hits the brakes, the body image stuff and the stress and being stuck in parent mode or work mode or whatever else you do mode that is very far away from erotic mode, you can leave that all behind. You close the door and all those other parts of your identity stay behind. That creates a context where your brake is freed up and your accelerator can go. And we're, uh, we are busy. We have a lot of other things to do. Yeah, and it for real. generally takes preparation and effort to create that context where you don't have to be in parent mode and distracted and in householding mode and distracted mm. and work mode and distracted. So when it feels like a project to get to the like, I want to be really present for my partner. I want to be able to like pay attention to the ways we're connecting. It actually does take effort. That is normal. You are doing it right if yeah. that is the way you experience it. And okay, I relate to this in a number of ways. First of all, talking about like vacation getaway sex is like, it can be absolutely amazing. And there's like, okay, we set aside this time. We're looking forward to it. We're going away for two nights. Like childcare is taken care of. This is about us connecting. We know like the moment we get in the, the room, we're going to have at it, and then we're going to have at it a few more times, as many times as we can. This is like the focus back of our back? getaway. Back to back? How long well, do you I have to wait? Know. Front to front? Back to back? No, how long do you have to wait in between? Um, <laughs> I mean, we're not teenagers anymore. I'm, the the perfect amount of time for us, Rhett. That, <laughs> oh, come the on. healthy amount of time for come us. On, but like, well, if you if, if if it was a competition, I just think answering that question doesn't. It's help not a anybody. competition. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say the the it is actually true that around eighteen, your testosterone levels peak, your sensitivity to it peaks, um, and so your refractory period, which is the amount of time it takes you to get an erection after the last time you ejaculated, that refractory period begins to lengthen, yeah. uh, and then the reliability of your erections gradually begins to go down as you get into the sort of like menopause age. Right. So that's real. So uh, yeah, as as you move through your 40s and into your 50s, and hopefully you live a long and erotic life deep into your 80s and 90s, your oh. erections are begin become less reliable, and that's fine. Erections come and go, and they are no more important than you decide to make them. But back mm. to the vacation sex for a second. Right. <laughs> All right. So, so it's like we can have this amazing experience, and then it's like, okay, why can't we just have that? You know, when we're back at Every home. Night. Of course, the answer is the life. context of life. Yeah. But one of the things that we'll do is like sometimes we're like we'll be having sex, and we will have a conversation about how great it is. We'd be like, why did it? Why did it? Why do we put this off? This is the most amazing thing that's yeah. happening right now. And then I start saying things like, "Let's let's commit right now to doing this again tomorrow night." Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. I'm having this like, but you also do that with things other than sex. Any time any group of you're in a group of people that are having a good time, you stop and make everyone acknowledge how good of a time we're having, <laughs> and and be like, "We have to plan the next one right now." I just think it's like let's make our decision about the next time we align based on this moment. Like, let's remember to factor this moment in and let's weight it properly. This is this is one of the most amazing experiences that we can have. Why did it take and longer than we And I listened to your virginity both... episode. It's free! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah, okay. I, I, I did my research. And, hey, look, I read your book. We're all on the same page here. You didn't have to do that, but it's free and it isn't, right? Um, yeah. there so there's actually an evidence base to what you're doing, which is the research on savoring. And there are parts of what you're doing that actually do increase the pleasure that you experience in the moment. And it shapes your memory. You're creating more of what in Inside Out, the Pixar cartoon, they call core memories, uh -huh. where you stop and you talk to other people about how great this is. 
you notice the sensations that are happening and how enjoyable they are. You compare it to like, man, those other poor saps who don't get to experience that. I feel so sorry for them. There's all kinds of skills that you can imply, em employ to make this moment. You like capture it in a photograph so that you can return to it really easily. And that yeah. means that when you look back on your life, you've just sort of accumulated peak moment after peak moment after peak moment. And your life feels both like it has been more worth living and like it has been longer. Nice. I love that the idea part... of a mental photograph and like I have like a whole pornographic drawer movie, of movie that. in your head. Yeah. From yeah. my practice. Yeah. And the part that's not evidence based is we need to start planning the next one now. <laughs> yeah. What, what I... about scheduled sex? Like, you know, uh Oh, we do that. Monday night is there's sexy lots, time. There's lots of I we don't do it every single week, but we'll do it I mean, there's lots of times where it's like if if I'm like, hey, you, you want to go for it, and then there's like, well, it, we're not in alignment, or sometimes it's like I we feel like it's been a while, and we're like, I still feel I feel like shit right now. I'm not in the mood, but let's set a let's set a, a date that we can look forward to uh, two nights from now, or whatever. We do that mm -hmm. all the time, and I feel like then we're each able to prepare in our own way. Mm -hmm. And also, like the expectations are aligned, so it's not like me walking up with a with a lightning bolt and springing it on her. That's what you call it. <laughs> That's what Emily calls it. Um, There's two answers, really. We, I recommend scheduled sex all the time. Like I said, we are busy. Anything not on my calendar doesn't happen. So. I schedule sex because that's especially when mm -hmm. I'm traveling a lot on the road. Um, and also, just because you scheduled it doesn't mean it's going to happen. There have been times when I was on the road traveling and I would get home and I like have this little window of time with my husband and it's scheduled and I show up and I put my body in the bed and I just like cry and fall asleep because <laughs> I'm so stressed and exhausted. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And fortunately, I have, I'm married to one of the best human beings on the face of the earth and he's just like, no, okay, you're not. I am. He really needs that more. <laughs> Gotcha. One of the best yeah, human just, beings on the face of the earth. The best. They're all tied. Like his, maybe there's like somewhere deep inside him, a part of him that's like, mm, we don't get sex. But he has never expressed that to me and he's always really kind and considerate. And the fact that he is so kind and considerate in that moment, like that builds a like, next time I'm going to be even more ready and enthusiastic because he's so understanding and kind that and That understanding sweet is and so sexy. And loving. It is so hot. The way he doesn't <laughs> criticize or judge me for being too tired to have sex. Oh, oh that's great. Well, and you know, because so, we, we we schedule. I, I think, and I speak. And I'm on the. I'm I'm not a scheduler in general, right? So, I think there are people who think like me, and my wife is even less of a scheduler than me. Would be like, oh, that takes some of the spontaneity out of it. But the fact is, is that, is that yeah. you the romance out of it? You schedule. We schedule fun things all the time. Like you say, we are going to Disneyland on Saturday. And it doesn't mean you don't enjoy Disneyland because you have a ticket and you've set aside the day, right? I, I, I right. you know, it's like, the only way I can enjoy Disneyland is if we make a decision right now to go and like, I don't, do we have tickets? I don't know, let's figure it out. That would be, in some ways, that can Pull be your a, pants down. a horrible experience, <laughs> right? So I definitely don't think scheduling is not sexy at all. Even as someone who has difficulty scheduling things. Including yeah. sex. You should see Christy's and planner. Boy, I, I think that might make her more horny than anything. <laughs> I mean, just a well-appointed calendar. Yes, that was the joke in 30 Rock when Liz Lemon wanted to get pregnant, when she was like, if I schedule it and plan it, and the way she could make like trying to get pregnant sexy was like the fact that she had to manage so many calendars in order to get it done. <laughs> right, yeah. But scheduling can backfire. So suppose you like set the date Saturday at three o'clock, Yumi in the red underwear. And one person like sees that date coming and is like revving up to the time. And the other person is like, oh, like it just feels like such an obligation. And I like, I'm gonna show up and he, they're gonna expect me to perform in a certain way. And just, it's too much pressure and it doesn't seem like it's gonna work. So scheduling does not work for everyone. Um, but I do have a friend who, the couple was like very stressed. They were working on a political campaign and it was approaching election time. Mm. Uh, so they were both just like, ah. and they would never have sex if they didn't schedule it. 
Yeah. And it even got to the point. So they got they got these dice, you know, like the silly dice that you roll and it tells you to do something. Mm -hmm. And it did not cause them to have more sex, but it caused them to spend an hour and a half on Saturday morning playing together and talking about intimacy. And that sustained an erotic connection through this incredibly stressful mm. season of their lives. And that's worthwhile too, even if you're not like having genital contact or doing something that counts in your mind as having sex. Mm -hmm. Erotic play together, reinforce play is the primary friendship social behavior. Mm. Playing together in that way helps to sustain the connection even when other things don't feel available. Um, oh, so that's good. that's context. Let's get back to the sex drive thing that you mentioned at the top. So sex yeah. drive is not a thing? Uh, yeah. So, like, I am not delusional. I know that sex drive is a very pithy, easy thing to say, but a sex drive means a very specific thing. Biologically, a drive is uh, like thirst and hunger. There is an uncomfortable internal sensation that is like a wooga, a wooga, red flashing lights as it pushes you out in the world to go solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And if you don't solve the problem of getting adequate hydration or adequate food or even, yes, adequate sleep, you have a sleep drive, what happens? You die. You, die. you literally die. <laughs> yes, that's a drive. Okay. Sex is not one of those. Nobody ever died because they couldn't get laid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody ever even got sick because they couldn't get laid. Yeah. But... What sex is, is a sexual incentive motivation system. And I know sex drive is so much easier to say. We're going to keep saying sex drive. But let's understand in our hearts that we mean an incentive motivation system. Instead of an uncomfortable internal state that pushes you to go fix the problem, mm -hmm. it is a pleasurable internal state that pulls you towards some attractive external stimulus. I always think of Bugs Bunny being pulled on a hand of steam toward an apple pie in a window. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, what's that? Right. Ooh, I would like yeah. to go get more of that. Sex is one of those. And it's important, first of all, to recognize that no one is going to literally die without sex. People do literally die of hunger, for example, which is why if someone steals a loaf of bread to feed their family, we can feel like, yeah, I get that. But uh, if someone hmm. touches someone else's sexual body... Hmm. Because they hadn't gotten laid in a really long time. Yeah, that's... It is not because they were starving. It's because they were really curious so that's, that's about invalid. the other person's wow, sexual body. That, that's, yeah. that, that's a great way of clarifying exactly how you parse that from a moral, you know, ethics standpoint, too. That's right. very helpful. Because an incentive motivation system is just as natural. It's, it can feel just as urgent. Like, we've all but curiosity is the ultimate, like, analog to horniness. You're just like, hmm. I just want to know more about that. I want to get closer. I want to explore it with every sense that I have. Yeah. That's curiosity. And we all know also that there are times in life when you are more curious and times in life when you are less curious. And that's not a problem. That's just the impact that context has on which motivational systems are most important right now. Wow. Well, this makes me, I, I, I want to get your, since, you know, when you speak, unlike when Link speaks or when I speak, you say things that are like informed and based on uh, extensive education, which, so while we've got you here, we're going to keep asking you questions. Yeah. Um, and it's like strange to me because we're the same age. Uh, I think about like what my life trajectory has been in parallel to your, like we were in college at the same time. And then y'all got married, and I stayed in school until I was 29. <laughs> well, you know what? It's paying off. Um, for all of us, it's paying off. Okay, asexuality, right, which has become right. something that uh, we've heard so much more about that what, you know, when I was a teenager, I didn't even know it existed, right? So one interpretation uh, uh, of it would be like, okay, well, is someone who considers themselves asexual, are they just someone who is just... The, they've got the parking brake on, on the in inhibition scale, or is that not a helpful way to think about that because that feels like it's some, like, like in other it's words, that is in fact factually incorrect. Right. That's what I thought too the first time I was beginning to learn about asexuality, but there's research on this about the sensitivity of the accelerator and the brakes of folks who identify as asexual, which is about 1% of the population in North America. And it turns out it is not that they have a more sensitive accelerator, or not that they have a more sensitive brake. Mm -hmm. It's that they have 
really insensitive accelerators. It Got takes it. so much sex-related stimuli to get their accelerator going. Um, in fact, uh, there's an asexuality, there's an asexual sex educator named Aubrey Lancaster who uses the analogy of Disneyland. Hmm. Oh, well, just, like, just can't like get me. enough of that. Just like me. Yeah. If you are married to a Disney fan and they God just love, you. love going to Disneyland Ooh. and they can go to Disneyland every day and you're like, oh, All like right. you, can, you can go to Disneyland now sometimes. I, now I really relate to it. <laughs> now I completely understand because I'm a, I'm a Disney sexual or whatever the, 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 the proper term would be. But because it matters to your partner, on a limited number of times, you will go with because it's fine, and then you need a long break before you go back yeah. again because that's enough. Asexuality is. But I have uh, been to the Corn Dog Castle, and I will say that that can turn a trip to Disneyland. That can completely turn the the day around for me. The Corn Dog I Castle. I don't know what that is. It's just a place that, that a, sells corn dogs. It's not a ride. At it's literally just corn dogs. <laughs> it's the okay. best part of Disneyland. They're giant. They're wonderful. I'm sure that fits in the metaphor somewhere, but I'm not exactly <laughs> sure how. Yeah, I don't know. It could look like a dildo. Yeah, I don't know. Right, I'm, wor yeah, I'm yeah, working yeah, at it. Yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah, what's yeah. happening. But asexuality is very varied. There are sex favorable ace folks who are like, I mean, okay. Like, I don't feel the main thing about asexuality is you don't feel sexual attraction to people. It's not that your sexual response mechanism doesn't function. A lot of ace folks masturbate, some mm. don't. Uh, it's that you don't feel that attraction. Got it. So you're not like drawn to the person. Uh, but if your partner really wants, you're like, yeah, okay, and it's fine. Uh, other folks are sex averse, where the idea of having sex is actively disgusting to them and they don't want any part of it. So it's a very diverse community. My favorite thing about ace folks is that they're entirely non-judgmental. They're very much about like, let me explore what feels right and good for me. And they often come up with great terms, demisexual, gray sexual, as well as asexual. Um, qua sexual is my favorite term. Qua is in the French what? Like, uh. Where you're just like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Qua sexual. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if we go back to people who they're like, I, I don't know. I, it, we talked about those categories, but if we go back to like, all right, uh, I'm in, again, I don't, I definitely don't want to use the term normal. I know that's not that's not what I'm looking for here. No, you're just sexual. But if you like sex, if you're if you're more sexual, you talked about a bike analogy, which I if I remember correctly, well, remind me of what the bike analogy is. What I maybe you don't remember either. You, any uh, nobody ever needs to ride a bike. Yeah, yeah, but is it in the orgasm chapter? I think that's right. I think it. What I took from it was. It, everybody does, you don't have to ride a bike, but if you want to ride a bike, you can. But you, And if you want to really enjoy it, if that's a priority of yours to ride a bike, well, you can learn how. You can enjoy it. You can experience yes. the thrill of riding a bike if you want to. And If, you if really, you're motivated enough. If you're motivated enough. So it's, to me, there's this thing about- what about a Peloton that just a stationary bike? Is that- Sure, does, that does, too. Does that change it? But it's like, that, it's not, Oh, well, everybody needs to ride a bike. Or everybody needs mm -hmm. to experience bike riding in the same way. But there is part of the analogy that's like, if if it's a priority of yours to experience bike riding, yeah, then there's also a good amount of work that goes into it. You're investing yourself to, to, to realize yeah. that enjoyment. That it takes learning. It doesn't just happen spontaneously. Yeah. Like you have to, the first time you try, the, so in the context of, for example, of learning how to have an orgasm for the first time, because you've never had an orgasm, a lot of people uh, judge themselves if they need to use a vibrator, for example, or just that it's been so long in their life and they still haven't learned how to do this thing. That criticism and judgment of yourself, it just hits the brakes and makes it even more difficult to access pleasure. So you're just going to not judge and be like, you know what, this takes practice. I never got practice. People told me I wasn't allowed to ride a bicycle. Mm. And now I am learning from scratch how to do this. And so you hope maybe you'll have a spotter. Maybe you'll have training wheels. Mm. And you'll go through the process of gradually learning. And 
when you learn to ride a bike, you might be like, all right, I did it. And then you're done. Or you might be like, this is amazing. And I'm going to ride a century now. <laughs> right. Um, well, to, to me, just the investment in my sex experience and like that, that aspect of me and Chrissy's relationship is something that we, we both learned that we need to work at. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, where is it, where does that fit in our priorities? And mm -hmm. let's, you know, sometimes you gotta analyze and make sure that your actions reflect that, you know? So it's, that's why I love coming back to this for the second year in a row, as I think well, I said last week, is that like, acknowledging that it's work, and then if you're into it and it's a priority of yours, it, it you know, it can be worth it. I think regardless of where you are and, you know, what your particular situation is, I think one of the reasons that this, I mean, not only is it, are these conversations fun and just, you know, lots of jumping off points for comedy, which <laughs> is what we're doing here, but also, and more importantly, is that I think that information and communication are all, in, in my mind, they're always good, right? Like when you, when you talk about the subject of sex and, and we're getting the, the actual information from someone who uh, you know, evidence ba your evidence based approach to to this stuff. This is this is ultimately it, it doesn't take away the sexiness to make it sciency to make it scientific, right? And well, if you're in my brain, it makes it way more sexy. <laughs> exactly. And so this uh -huh. it, being able to learn these things, and then what I hope comes from us talking about these things is you know I know us having this conversation will lead to me and Jesse having a conversation about the things that we talked about, right? And having those conversations that involve fact-based, evidence-based information. I've never seen engaging in that way lead to a negative outcome. It always yeah. seems to move in the positive direction when we give ourselves more, we get more equipped with more information and we continue talking about it. That's what we always talk about is that for us and our friendship, communication has been so, instrumental and that's people are like well how are you still working together after all this time how are you still friends since first grade it's like well you got to keep you it, there's ups and downs but you have to keep talking about it and we approach our marriages in the same way yeah. um and and hopefully you can take the information that we've gotten from uh Emily today and then apply it to whatever situation you are and there's so much more information you've got this book you've got your previous book where can people get everything they need to get from Dr. Emily Nagoski. Well, reading the books is always a great place to start. There's Come As You Are and the Come As You Are workbook. If you find that stress is really interfering with your uh, sexuality, that's the reason I wrote Burnout with my identical twin sister, um, because she literally ended up hospitalized because of burnout stress. Hmm. Whoa. Uh, and uh, I'm about to launch a Come As You Are podcast from Pushkin Industries that oh, launches yeah. in November. Nice. And uh, All I'm All right, you're currently... working with that Malcolm Gladwell. He shows up at every meeting. He has some great questions about orgasm. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> and uh, I'm currently finishing a book about sex in long-term relationships called Come Together. Oh, well, hey, there you go. That'll be out next summer. Yeah, we're, we're ready for that one. I want to see the cover yeah. to that one. It's actually interesting. The very first chapter is called Why Have Sex? Okay. And you were talking about like putting work into it and like why? Why put the effort into doing this Frankly, pretty silly, ridiculous, sometimes very important, sometimes a little messy, hmm. often very silly thing that we humans do. Why do we do it? Hmm. Like talking to your partner, like why do we do this? What, what right. does it bring to our relationship? Can't wait. Jenna, what about you? Closing thoughts. I My kind of closing thoughts were uh, just how wonderful this book and just allowing the conversations about sex can be so helpful because I'm in my 30s now and I read your book uh, when I turned 30, like right around when I turned 30. And it was one of those things I b began reflecting on as a person who grew up um, being like, raised female and, and with that, um, mm -hmm. all those connotations that come with it. And how much reflecting I did on being high, um, uh, high accelerator medium breaks mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. realizing the coping mechanisms I used in my early 20s 
because of those things and how I wish I had this kind of knowledge when I was in my early 20s because there certainly was reckless and toxic behavior in my uh, sex life and in my like relationships in general. So like I just loved reading this and be and I yeah, I refer it to anyone I can like anyone I can, especially like how Lily uh, was given the book uh, link that you said and like I've given the book to um, a girl that's kind of she's kind of like a younger sister mentee kind of thing family friend who's in college as well and we've had those discussions and it just feels really nice to have those people and be able to express that in such a way I guess and it I just, I didn't have that. I didn't have that. And I really like being able to talk about it now and encouraging others to talk Yay. about it. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's my I, closing. Totally time. agree. I didn't have it either. And that is why I wrote the books. I'm thrilled to hear that. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thanks so doing, much for your work. Doing great work, Emily. Thanks so much Thank for you. spending some time talking with us and putting up with our uh, rabbit trips. <laughs> <laughs> Total delight. That was a splendid time. Yes, it was. Uh, I'm excited about that podcast. I mean, yeah. now I'm going to have to have two sex podcasts that I listen to. I'm going to have to listen to Sex with Emily and the Come As You Are podcast when that's talk, that comes out. And I yep. got in that book about uh, long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. Come with me. Is that what she said? It was Love it. Come together. Because that's what we've got. Long-term relationships. Um, next week, we're going to be hearing from you. We're going to be... Um, so... <laughs> Let's see how that goes. <laughs> it, the sex talks continue for one more episode. Use hashtag Ear Biscuits now to give us responses, or of course, you can always leave us a voicemail, 188-EARPOD1. See you next week. Hey, Written Link, this is Amber from Austin, Texas. I just finished listening to the episode, How Much Do We Know About Orgasms with Dr. Emily Moore. I grew up in a very religious Christian home, and I was sexually repressed, which is something that I'm still struggling to overcome to this day. I had never heard of Dr. Emily before, and I learned some great things from her on your podcast. So thanks again. I love you all. Bye. Hey, you guys. Thank you so much for the episode with Dr. Emily Morse. And I want to particularly say thank you to Jenna for speaking so openly about women's sex. I'm a 49-year-old female and um, thought I was in a pretty good group. <laughs> But uh, she did make some really great points about the shame that you feel about certain things and, and the pleasure. That was one of the most enlightening episodes that I've ever heard you guys do. And this is too long a message for you to put on the air. I listen to you all the time, but September actually means something. I've learned a lot. Hey, Red and Link. You know what? I just got to say, I just absolutely love and adore you guys. You guys have been part of my life for 10 plus years now and you are the greatest youtubers that i've ever known and i just love you guys for being true down south awesome dads awesome husbands great people and i just love you guys and that's all to watch more ear biscuits click on the playlist on the right to watch the previous episode of ear biscuits click on the playlist to the left and don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe if you prefer to listen to this podcast it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms thanks for being your mythical best